In the 1930s, at the height of luxury ocean liner travel, a voyage seemingly cursed with misfortune took place on the churning seas of the North Atlantic that would leave over 130 people dead, and in the process, create one of the most iconic images of a ship engulfed in flames, the destruction of the SS Morrow Castle being cemented in the hearts and minds of the people living on the quiet coastline of New Jersey. The origins of the SS Morrow Castle dated back to the Merchant Marine Act of May 22, 1928, which, following its passing in Congress, provided American shipping lines with up to $250 million in construction funds with which to replace their older vessels with new ones, these loans, which subsidized up to 75% of the overall assembly cost, being paid back over the course of 20 years at very low interest rates. The Act, which also came under the title of the Jones-White Act, was drafted in order to allow American merchant shipping lines to be financially competitive against British, French and German companies, one of the lines to benefit from the Act being the New York and Cuba Mail Steamship Company, but by this point was known as the Ward Line, a firm that specialized in the transport of mail, cargo and passengers up and down the eastern seaboard between the USA and Cuba. At the time, the Ward Line, thanks to service reductions, poor management and an aging fleet, was teetering on bankruptcy, and was only saved due to cash injections by the US government, the Act of 1928 allowing for the firm to build two new liners, which were constructed by the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company, the SS Orient, and the SS Morrow Castle. The SS Morrow Castle, named after the stone fort that guards the entrance to Havana Harbor, was laid down at the Newport News Shipyard in Virginia during mid-1929, and was constructed at a cost of $4 million, or $60 million in 2021, the vessel being launched on March 5, 1930, while fitting out continued until August 15th, with her maiden voyage being undertaken eight days later. The ship was 480 feet long, 70 feet wide, and was powered by General Electric twin turbo generators with two propellers, capable of attaining a top speed of 20 knots, while the ship's capacity allowed for the carriage of 489 passengers, who could be served by up to 240 crew. The main goal of the Ward Line, especially following the Wall Street crash of 1929, was to allow for luxurious travel on the prime holiday route between New York and Havana, but at a price that undercut its competitors, and thus the introduction of the Morrow Castle in the Orient, combined with low fares, meant it could easily weather the storm of the subsequent recession and work into the 1930s. The Morrow Castle quickly gained a reputation for being a non-stop party at sea, its exemption from the oppressive rules of Prohibition-era America meaning that liquor could be openly consumed by the passengers and crew, making it the perfect getaway for those wishing to forget the blues of the Depression back in the States, while also relishing the prospect of the wild nightlife of Cuba in the 1930s. The Morrow Castle, much like her sister ship, could undertake the 1,100-mile voyage in around 59 hours, and due to the demand being placed on the vessels, there was rarely time available to give them major overhauls, the ships being lathered in layers of thick paint in order to keep them fresh. The ship continued on its usual New York to Havana run for five years, when, on September 5, 1934, the unsuspecting vessel and crew departed Cuba for the final time with a return voyage to New York, the first two days of the journey going smoothly, although increasing cloud cover and swells experienced as the ship paralleled the Florida and Carolina coastlines heralded that a nor'easter was brewing. A nor'easter is a cyclonic weather system that originates within 100 miles of America's eastern seaboard between North Carolina and Massachusetts bringing with it high winds and precipitation that varies depending on the time of year, including heavy rain and snow, while also causing severe coastal flooding, coastal erosion, hurricane-force winds, or blizzard conditions. For the SS Morrow Castle, the appearance of a nor'easter was unusual, as these storms are normally associated with the winter months, occurring most frequently between November and March when cold polar air from the northeast, hence the name, meets warm air from the Gulf and Caribbean but on rare occasions they can take place outside winter. By the end of September 7th, the ship was well within the clutches of the storm, and most passengers had sought shelter in their cabins, but all was not well aboard the vessel, as the captain, Robert Wilmot, complained of stomach trouble, and within the hour had succumbed to an apparent heart attack, leaving command in charge of Chief Officer William Warms, all while 30 mile an hour winds continued to batter the Morrow Castle. The worst had yet to come though, as at around 2.50 a.m. on September 8, 1934, a fire broke out in storage locker B in the first-class writing room on B deck, and within minutes had rapidly spread across the ship, the cause for such a quick propagation of the blaze being due largely to the aforementioned smothering of the ship's wooden surfaces in paint, rendering much of the vessel highly flammable. 
combined with high winds that fanned the flames through the ornate wooden interiors, the crew were unable to bring it under control, and after 20 minutes the ship was plunged into darkness as the fire burned through the main electrical cables, causing the radio to fail after only one SOS message had been transmitted, while also cutting the hydraulic lines that allowed the bridge to steer the ship. Now drifting aimlessly in the writhing North Atlantic, panic spread as quickly as the fire, and in many cases the ill-prepared and inexperienced crew abandoned ship by stealing most of the 16 lifeboats, leaving passengers no choice but to either escape to exposed parts of the vessel, mostly the stern, or attempt to jump into the blackened, foaming ocean waters. While other crew members bravely stayed with the passengers, and even threw sun chairs and life rings over the side to give those in the water a means of flotation, the escape of the other crew members meant that less than 85 of the ship's 408 passengers were able to leave the vessel by lifeboat, while many others, due to a lack of training with the life jackets and preservers, inflated them before jumping overboard, causing them to either break their necks or be knocked unconscious upon impact with the water. Meanwhile, rescue ships began to move in, but their speed was impaired by the storm, with four other merchant ships and liners arriving to provide aid, while the Coast Guard, who had provided their cutters Tampa and Cahoon, were positioned too far from the ship to provide assistance to those in the water, compounded further by the aerial station at Cape May, New Jersey, failing to dispatch float planes during the early stages of the disaster. As this was all taking place only eight miles off the New Jersey coast, the burning liner was visible from the townships of Long Beach Island, thus rescue efforts were quickly enacted by lifeguards to receive both survivors and lifeboats washing ashore on the beach, while local fishing boats and pleasure craft also set out to render assistance, though they were largely ineffective on the turbulent swells. By dawn, most of the passengers and crew had been rescued, and the blazing vessel, with most spaces having been burned out by the inferno, was now a smouldering wreck that was carried on the inshore current, eventually becoming beached at Asbury Park, New Jersey, approximately 56 miles south of New York, and at the same location the sailing ship, New Era, had been beached on November 13, 1854, killing 150 people. The charred hulk remained in situ on the beach for six months, until eventually, after the ward line had declared the ship a total loss, the ruined vessel was refloated and towed to New York for breaking, but due to the ship's position next to the shore, and the devastating circumstances under which it had been destroyed, thousands of tourists converged on the beach and pier at Asbury Park in order to get a close-up view of the mangled Morrow Castle. In the end, 86 passengers and 49 crew were victims of the tragedy, and the official inquiry into the disaster laid blame on the ship's veneered wood and flammable paint, its ineffective fire doors and fire hose water pressure, a lack of emergency training for the passengers, and the uncoordinated and incompetent response of the crew when dealing with the blaze, acting Captain Warms facing particular scrutiny due to his decision not to leave the bridge and continue steaming into a headwind. As for the cause, suspicion as to arson fell upon Chief Radio Engineer George W. Rogers, who was initially hailed as a hero for his part in rescuing passengers aboard the Morrow Castle, but later became the primary culprit after his personal history revealed he had been involved in a fire at his previous employment, while his own business, which he established after the loss of the Morrow Castle, also burnt down. In March 1938, after joining the Bayonne Police Department as a radio assistant, Rogers was convicted of attempted murder after nearly killing his superior, Lieutenant Vincent Doyle, with a homemade bomb concealed inside a fish tank heater after the latter began asking him questions about his role in the Morrow Castle disaster to which he was sentenced to between 12 and 20 years in prison, but was ultimately paroled in 1942 in order to fight in World War II, though the military chose not to accept him. He was later imprisoned again in 1954 after being found guilty of murdering a friend who had loaned him money, along with the friend's daughter, whereupon he died four years later. But regardless, no evidence was established that could make him the perpetrator of the Morrow Castle fire, and thus the exact cause has never been fully determined. Whatever the cause, the blaze aboard the Morrow Castle led to the adoption of tighter maritime safety standards, including fire retardant materials, improved fire doors and alarms, and more rigorous emergency training for crew and passengers. But all this came too late for the 135 souls that perished on the dark, writhing waves of the North Atlantic. <laughs>